Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome to the Truth Factor Discussion. It's so good to have you today, to have your presence. Internetly speaking, if I can say that word, as we sit down to factor the truth into our daily lives. Gentlemen, see if you can do a little bit better on your introductions. How are y'all doing today? Daniel, let's start with you. I'm doing fantastic, brother. Glad you're doing well, and, and we hope everyone this morning or this afternoon is doing well. Uh, maybe even some this evening, I'm not sure. Uh, but we, we're glad you joined us, and I encourage you to do one thing. I encourage you to, to grab a Bible, whether it be electronically or, or hard copy, and follow along with us. We'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in today's study, and we just hope that you'll compare what we say with God's Word, because we certainly are not the authority, but God is. How are you doing today, Paul? Doing great and glad to be with you. Glad we can study together for a little while and look forward to opening up to this book of 1 Corinthians. We see there that there were Christians that had lots of problems that they were dealing with, but if they would turn to the Word of God and just submit to that, that they could be right before God. That's what we want to do. We want to factor the truth into our daily lives just to submit to what His will says that we ought to do. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Paul, Daniel, John, and everybody in our listening audience. Uh, Again, it is an honor to, to to be able to share with you a portion of God's Word, and I'm uh, excited about this part of the week every week. Uh, you know, we, we see on, on television there's been that commercial uh, about the camel walking around saying hump day. <laughs> you know, uh, well, this is a good way to start the middle of the week, so... <laughs> so, so begin begin the day, and this is true in, on this on the West Coast. Begin the day with a Bible study, and then end the day with a Bible study. Sounds good, and I like that, and that's what we are doing here today. Well, last week in our study, we um, reached, uh, we studied up through First Corinthians chapter three, right about verse nine. And so we were in the middle of this section here when we had to stop our study last week. So what we're going to do here in just a moment is resume our discussion there with verse 10. With verse 10. But before we do that, what I'd like to do is take a moment and we'll back up to verse 5. And let's read verses 5 through 9 just to kind of remind us of the context um, that of this particular section of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul, would you like to read uh, verses 5 through 9 for us? I'd be very happy to do that, uh, John. We'll be reading in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 through 9. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. Thank you, Paul. Now probably what I should have done is have us go up a little bit farther there, but within this context here, Paul had made the point in verse 5 that there were some individuals who were saying, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos. And we talked some about this when we looked at chapter 1. But the point that Paul seems to be making in verses 5 through 9 and even following is that fundamentally he is nothing and Apollos is nothing. The one that we are to focus on is, of course, God. Paulus, you know, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered. But it's our God that gives the increase there. And so, as in verse 7, so then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. You know, there is no room in the kingdom for big headed preachers, there's no room in the kingdom for arrogant Bible class teachers. In the end, we are all simply servants of God. We think about what Jesus said in Luke chapter. Uh, chapter 17, verse 10, I believe it is, after we've done all that we've been commanded to do, we still declare ourselves unprofitable servants. And Paul was making this point to try to get the members to understand that they don't need to focus on the teacher. Uh, they don't need to focus on the one who baptized them, but it's on God. Um, it reminds me of uh, the statement that Jesus says, uh, you know, call no man rabbi or call no man teacher, for there's only one teacher. 
And, and the point is, is that no one person is so special that they should be elevated above all other Christians, um, that we are all, in the end, equal servants of God. And, and that's kind of the point that he's making here. Right. Uh, any thoughts right. on that? Yeah. Uh, uh, one thing to understand in all of that is that doesn't mean that it's wrong to say have your favorite preacher or, or, or somebody that you've studied with and you've been with and, and you just rely on them and you can go to them with anything. That's, that's not the point that is here. The, the, the point is, is making them a source of authority to the exclusion of others and, and challenging your relationship with others based upon how they feel about your favorite preacher or your favorite yeah. brother or whatever. So. Tom, you don't have to defend Terry. I know that. It's okay if you're her favorite preacher. There's nothing <laughs> wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> first thought was, so said the preacher. <laughs> oh, let's bite my tongue here. <laughs> you know, there have been, uh, what Tom points out, though, uh, that there has been that kind of problem yeah. oh, among brethren in the past. Uh, I've made the mistake of saying something that I disagreed with. Uh, a very well-known preacher of that day, who's no longer with us, uh, but that I, I disagreed with him. I thought he was wrong on something, and wow, you think he's wrong? You know, who do you think you are? <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. And it, it was just a matter that uh, you know, we, we disagreed on what the Bible uh, would say about that, and we need to always be going to the authority, going to the Word of God, and realize that, as uh, I think John pointed out there, that we are just servants. We are ministers. Uh, we, we must just uh, humbly submit ourselves to God and do His will. Yeah, try being exactly. 22 years old, coming in and saying somebody <laughs> or some preacher was wrong and, and getting, who are you? This man's been preaching 50 years. How could you possibly be right and him be wrong? Like right. as if, yeah. uh, y like you said, as if he is the authority. The answer is, or the question is, what, what ver what's the Bible say? What's that right. standard uh, set? And so in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9, also in, in this, I know some translations will say, for we are uh, fellow workers with God. I would argue that the, being God's fellow workers is not with God, because we're not on the same pedestal as right. God, but we're under God. We work in this, we work together corporately in the service of God. Uh, that being the point there, not a, as putting us in the same sentence with God in any way. That's a good point. And Daniel, when I made that statement, I was probably about 22 years old. So. <laughs> well, I tell you, there, there is a challenge when you are a young preacher. All right, there is a young, there is a great. Oh, challenge. Absolutely. absolutely. Because because you look to older preachers and you want to believe that they have it figured out, and especially if it's someone, let, let's say someone that you've grown up respecting, and. You, you just never imagined that they could be wrong, and so you start preaching, and you start having to make sure you actually believe, all right, the things that you're teaching. And imagine that. Preachers have to make sure they actually believe what they're preaching. And so you begin to study through it and realize, I'm not seeing it the way this older brother. And it causes you to doubt yourself, but the more you yeah. study, the more, I don't say confident you become, but the more assured you become in the teachings of the Scriptures. Right, and and don't forget Paul's warning to you know Paul was writing to Timothy, a young yeah. man, no about man that very very thing. So yeah, so That's I right. mean, yeah, you know, let, let no, no man despise, despise you. your youth. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So with that being said, and again, here again, the focus is on the context of First Corinthians chapter three. There, let's pick up there with verse ten. And Tom, I'll throw it to you, and if you would, read for us verses 10 and 11. Okay, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and start with verse 11, which throws into the con, or verse 9, which throws into the context. But So, okay. you know, we, even though it's just there. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, I think that's a good uh, stopping point there for just a few minutes as we kind of talk about this. So, as Tom, as you pointed out there, we do kind of bring verse 9 into this. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. So according to the grace of God, he says, which was given to me as a wise 
master builder. I've laid the foundation. Right. What's your thoughts on that, Tom? As far as him being a wise master builder, what what, what do you think about that? Okay. Okay. Well, first of all, one comment I want to make, tying it together with verse number nine and mm -hmm. all of this. Remember, he's talking about the church and uh, local a congregation, congregation. A congregation. Okay. I think he's talking about a yeah. congregation. Yeah. You know, uh, and it and it would apply to the church universally as well. And so uh, I see the point that Paul is making here is that that uh, in God's eyes he is he is a wise master builder, which means the idea that he is somebody who has um, experience, somebody who has the training and and the knowledge and so on, and he's using his ability to strengthen the Lord's church. Uh, of course, he acknowledges that it is something that God provided to him. And the point that he's getting at in all of this is getting back to Jesus Christ, that he's the ultimate foundation, and you've got to build on him, not on not on Paul or Apollos or Cephas and so on. All right. Well, Daniel, what's your thoughts on that? Do you kind of would see that the same way? Yeah, and, and when looking at, at Paul in, in verse 10, I think the fact that he says, according to the grace of God given to me, uh, mm -hmm. number one, he rules out any idea that he himself could be the foundation. Right. He, he rules out the fact that uh, it's it's from him in any way, shape, or form. And, and I know some versions will say wise master builder. I, I think skilled may be more the sense of the word, but I like the, the word wise that Paul uses in there in that kind of context to mean skilled because he's connected with, connecting it with his wisdom teaching in general, is that the way one becomes wise is not by... It, it, getting to God's wisdom is not obtained through increasing human wisdom. That's not the way it goes. But to get to God's wisdom, you have to throw out human wisdom in order to obtain God's wisdom. And so the, the fact that Paul is a skilled master builder in this sense is the reason he can be is because he has thrown aside that human wisdom and only used God's wisdom in order to do that. So if we want to be builders like Paul was, we have to do it through God's wisdom, not human wisdom or human standards. And, and that's one of the reasons he's able to lay this foundation, that being the doctrine that he, he's preached that involves specifically Christ crucified as the center of the message with it. Right. And and I also believe that in a direct in indirect way that the point Paul is making is that uh, he's inspired. You know, I, th I think this is one of those passages that in an indirect way is appealing to how he is an inspired apostle. Well, Paul, let I, me ask you this then. Let me throw this to you. Do you think that maybe in the context where he says, which was given to me as a wise master builder, is maybe could it be not so much a comment about him being a wise master builder, but the trust that God had in him to, through his grace, give him the opportunity to teach? Right. Well, uh, certainly I think that, that there's a portion of that. And I thought as I uh, thought about this passage, I thought about Paul's apostleship a little bit and the fact that he he was there uh, taking the gospel to the whole world and, and preaching this message. But I think there is an application here for those who teach the Word of God that we need to make it our aim. I like that word that Daniel uh, mentioned. I think it is the way in which it's uh, rendered in the ESV, the mm -hmm. skilled uh, builder, the skilled master builder. And when you think about that, every one of us need to do our very best to be experts at teaching the Word of God. Uh, right. Notice there, that's not a, that's not a big-headed thing as we talked about, uh, saying that, uh, oh, well, I'm an expert, I, I'm uh, the best at this or something like that. I don't mean that. But just to be studying the Word of God and when folks are able to uh, have doubts and concerns, that we can point them toward the Word of God we can point them toward the evidence that's found. Uh, we can help them to be able to understand and to know and to believe the truth. And when they do that, to help them obey that truth. Uh, that every one of us ought to be doing that, to be the very best teacher we can possibly right. be concerning God's Word. Right, yeah. Yeah, Paul, uh, as I understand the Scriptures, nowhere are we ever condemned for having too much biblical wisdom. Uh, <laughs> however, however... It's the attitude that's the issue. Absolutely. You know. 
Well, let's let's take a minute and step over uh, to the chat room because we've got a couple of things, uh, comments there that have come up within that, and we'll bring them into the study here. Uh, Richard Dodson, going back a few minutes here in our discussion, uses the term preacher-itis, preacher-itis that we were talking about earlier. And then uh, Richard Dodson says, if the Bereans double-checked Paul with the scriptures, shouldn't we with all preachers? And that's exactly right, you know. There should be a measure wherein we have a confidence, I guess, in a manner of speaking. I mean, think about think about the number of people that, that listen to you preach, you know, as a preacher. Let's say Tom, Paul, or Daniel, um, or, or your brother Haynes, or, or whoever that we have joining us. And there are a lot of people who will listen to what you say and say, yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I agree with that. But even so, we should still be willing to double check, and that's exactly right. Um, and... and uh, can I make a Go comment ahead. real quick? Because, mm-hmm. and I think that's something uh, we always have to have humility and be excited when people double check what we say. Some yeah. preachers I know, when you question them, they have this attitude: "Why are you questioning me? You think I'm a false teacher?" You know, and the the reaction should be: Man, "I'm excited you're going to go check that out because I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to do th- some study and investigation in what I say." And Daniel, on yeah. that same point, you've probably all heard preachers, maybe you've said it yourself, uh, that if you find something wrong that I'm preaching, something in error, uh, bring that to my attention, uh, come discuss that with me, and we'll open up the scriptures. Uh, if you say that, you better mean it. Amen. because uh, And, and I, I say you ought to say it, but you ought to mean it as well. Mm-hmm. Sorry, it sounds Dan. good to say, but you got to mean it, yep. All right, let's continue. A couple more comments. Uh, is guest 939 uh, a relative of yours, Tom? Yeah, that's From my dad. Ozark? That's your dad. Yeah, okay, that I thought is my so. dad, so. Yeah. Uh, Paul, as an apostle, was given by inspiration the plan devised by God for the building of Christ's church, uh, whether it be the, the universal church, as we understand, the body of Christ, or the individual congregations, the establishment of those. That's exactly right. He goes on to say, remember the Christians continued in the uh, Apostles' Doctrine, Acts 2.42, Acts in Ephesians 2.20. Okay. And um, when you teach people, you show them that you have hope. So it's a very good point. Very good point, Richard Dodson says. Amen to those comments. Yeah, most definitely. All right, well, let's continue here with what we're looking at then. Um, <clears throat> he makes the point there, uh, oh, I wanted to think, not to push the Lego movie, but who saw <laughs> the Lego movie? Okay. Um, yeah, I just did. An, an, an interesting, an interesting point that was made about the Lego Movie that, and the reason I say this because we use the term wise master builder. In the Lego Movie, movie, the wise master builder was the one that had the creativity to go outside of the instruction. <laughs> So we're not talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> okay, I just thought I, you know, I was paying attention, only slept through the first 15 minutes of the movie. So, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so anyway, with that being said, he says the last part of verse 10, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. Um, <laughs> sorry, Daniel. <laughs> You're killing me, man. Yeah, he, he makes the point here, and this is really where we need to look at this now. He says, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. All right, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. Um, this is this pretty simple in concept, saying that Paul simply comes in, and Paul would teach the word, and then someone else would come along and then teach the brethren, and someone else would come along and teach the brethren. Is, is it that simple, that that's what he's talking about? In the coming verses, he talks about different kinds of building on that foundation. Okay. All right. yeah, and, and I think uh, I would agree with your, your point or your question or say yes to it, uh, John, that I do think that is the point is that uh, Paul being the first one to preach at Corinth laid the foundation. He was the one who planted, if you will. And that seems to be the synonym, synonyms are, are the, the planting is a synonym with laying the foundation and then those coming after, building on the foundation, are the waterers, if you will. And and, and that seems to be the parallel in this analogy. Right. But I'm open for any correction if right. you guys disagree. No, I, I, think, I think you're exactly right, but I, I do want to make this observation. Putting it in the entire context, going back to chapter 1, the whole point that he's making is don't put somebody above anybody else. Right. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, so with that being said then, we each have to take care of how we build. Every preacher needs to exercise caution. Every teacher needs to exercise caution, obviously, when they come in to teach the Word of God to make sure the building, uh, the brethren are stronger. Um, and I think it's a good question for every preacher to ask themselves. When you move from a congregation, ask yourself, have the brethren been better off with your being there or worse off? If you're a Bible class teacher, ask yourself when you're done, were the, was the class better off with me or actually worse off? You know, we need to think about our abilities to teach and the truth that we teach there. And, um, and did you truly preach because you thought that would be in their best interest, not necessarily because that was your favorite subject for the day or something you wanted well, to, to cover? So. I like this place. I don't want to move from this place. And if you want to change your preachers, you need to find some other place to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Is it really better for the congregation? Um, right. So then with that being said, then verse 11, he makes the point that no other foundation can anyone lay than that which was laid, which is Jesus, laid, which was Jesus Christ. In other words, while a preacher may move to an area and spend a year teaching the Word of God to the lost and ultimately establish a local congregation, He's, in the end, done only what he was supposed to have done as a servant because Jesus himself has actually laid that foundation. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Uh, Jimmy the K uh, references Romans 15.20, and, and that's actually a, a cross-reference that I have for in, in just a second, but uh, I think it'd be helpful if we uh, did go there. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll bring that. Let me let's see. i got the chat room up. Let me bring the Bible program up real quick, and we'll get okay. there. Romans 15.20. Yes, sir. Okay, I had it. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. And it says, And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. And, and just the point is relating this same analogy that Paul was trying to go where there wasn't a foundation, i.e. where the gospel hadn't been preached in places for the fir first time. Uh, and, and that seems to be his his ambition there in Romans chapter 15, yeah. but he uses the same analogy, and I like that reference. Exactly. That's a good cross-reference to that. All right. Now, Paul, you brought up something just a moment ago that I, th I think we're, we're getting into, unless there's any other comments before we hit verse 12. No? Okay. You know, Paul, Paul talked about a while ago the different types of foundation that the Apostle Paul referenced uh, that some people would build. And so let's read verses 12 and 13. Paul, if you would, I'll throw that over to you. Be happy to do that. It says, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. All righty. And I realize that the context continues there, but we're going to stop for just a moment, kind of focus on these two verses here. So he says, now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will be manifested. All right. What are y'all's studied thoughts on what he's saying there? in this section, specifically in 12 and 13. Uh, Tom, you want to you wanna take it first? Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Novel uh, thoughts to Daniel, that's fine. No, 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 no. Don't no, no. phone a friend. Yeah. Well, no, no. Uh, uh, obviously, I mean, this is a challenging passage, and what I mean by that is there's a, there's a lot of debate over this because cause when you get into the next couple of verses, it talks about, uh, the work being burned and so on. And obviously, the point that he's making here is, while there's different types of materials, uh, some are more lasting than others, and some are more precious, more more valuable than others. Uh, that's not to say that they're not all needed. You know, there there's time when wood and hay and straw might be needed, uh, but if you want permanent. You're gonna you're gonna need the other types of materials and so on. So I I, I kind of see that uh, at the beginning, and I think the point that Paul's making is, uh, it, it, we'll we'll get into First Corinthians 12 a little ways down the road, where he talks about the body, and every part has okay. a purpose. It does. Okay. It. So I I kind of see it from that standpoint. Okay, but you think about it though. He uses he. 
says in the next verse that these things will be tested by fire. Right. Um, Daniel, do you think that that reference to fire maybe sheds a little bit light onto the quality of the material used, that uh, especially the wood and the hay and so forth? Yeah, absolutely, and 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 really, I think he's he's somewhat switching gears in verse twelve because in, in verse eleven and preceding, it seems to be the idea of the foundation. To where in verse twelve, it's building on the foundation. So to me, it seems to be switching gears slightly. Okay. Uh, but there's two ways that you can build improperly. One of the ways is that you can tamper with the foundation because if you're trying to tamper with Christ as a foundation, you're doing it wrong. The second way he introduces in verse 12 is by using the wrong materials to build on the foundation. So you may not mess with the foundation specifically, but if you're building with the wrong materials, it's not going to last. And I like his his list where he doesn't even break stride. I don't even think there's any conjunctions in the Greek that are, are connecting these or are trying to make a split, but he just starts naming them. And as you, if you've already read this, you know he's going to test these things by fire, and he just starts naming things. Gold, silver, precious stones. Up to this point, you're going, okay, these are lasting things that will be proven by fire. Then he, he doesn't change. He just says wood, hay, straw, and you go, wait, that's a little different. <laughs> well, when you add fire to those things, uh, they don't last as long. They, they aren't going to uh, be able to stand that fire. And so he's just naming all of these materials, and I like his, uh, his, his list as far as not giving it his point away yet. Uh, of course, okay. we have hindsight. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> All right. Well, let me, let, me, let me step aside then for a minute and kind of um, – Add, add a little bit of clarity so that we so that everybody knows exactly what he's talking about here um, and make sure that we're on, on the same page with this. When he talks about adding on the foundation, he's talking about converting people to Christ. So the, 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 the building upon the foundation, is that is he talking about adding people, converting people to Christ, making converts? Would that be a, something that, that we would be agreed upon? I think it not necessarily restricted to that, just mm -hmm. teaching in general after Paul. Uh, and I would compare it with the synonym uh, to watering. Um, watering a plant that exists does not always necessarily mean in, in the conversion process, but uh, can just mean preaching in general, if that makes sense. But well, it, it does, but what, what, I, what, I, what I'm looking back to is now if anyone builds on the foundation. And and I, I here's here's where I'm going with this and, and I'll make sure that um that I am clear on this because I, I I'm might not be clear even while with my own head. <laughs> All right. There are certain things that we are responsible for. We're responsible for the way that we teach, the method in which we teach, and this the content of what we teach. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if we're all teaching the truth and we're teaching the truth with love for all intents and purposes, the quality of that material should be the same. Okay, but the result of our teaching is not always the same. You think about the parable of the sower. There are going to be some who will obey the gospel, and two days later they're, they're gone hiking somewhere else. You've got some who will become Christians, but they never do anything. They're apathetic. Then you've got some who are filled with fervor and zeal, and, and they, they bear, bear fruit. My, my question is, because when we look at the, the rest of this text, we know that we're not accountable okay, right. for whether or not what we have laid upon the foundation survives. So that's what makes me wonder if maybe he is talking about um, our responsibilities to teach. Now, what happens to those individuals who obey the gospel or don't, that's not what we're going to have to give an account for. Could that be right. the, the, the materials there that he's talking about? Right. No, I, I uh, agree with your later implications. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. In the chat room... Okay. My dad yeah. Make some of the observation. I think it kind of goes along with what you said there. So. Uh, hang on, hang on, just a minute here. Yeah. So. Okay. Let me get that ready. <laughs> now, let me make a suggestion here, y'all. Paul, Paul had to step away, so he auto switching is going to be in place. So that means let the, whoever's talking, everyone else keeps quiet, so it doesn't jump back and forth on the screen screen there. <laughs> um, now, with that being said. And I didn't tell y'all to do this so you'd be quiet while I'm talking. Um, where do you want to begin, Tom, in reading from the chat room? Well, uh, 
I th I think we've we've got up through Jimmy the K with the First Corinthians three ten. Did he? Yeah, because uh, yeah, he okay. was talking about his previous the conversation. He was talking about the Romans fifteen twenty. So, righty. Uh, with let... my guest nine thirty nine, which is which is my dad. Okay, let me bring that up here just a second. So. All right, now. Okay. It's good. the camera is going to be on you, so go ahead. It's it's not going to it's not going to show this on on the screen. Okay, and and so my dad makes the point: those who build on the foundation use the material available. Unbeknown to the builder, he may not know the quality of the material. That is why Paul says, "Take heed how you build." And then he makes he says, "Sometimes the quality of the material will be known only after it is tested." Uh, and so he says, it's, "You test it by fire." So. So it's it's kind of the the, the same thought there. Right. Yeah, same thought, the observation you were making. So. Okay, all right, yeah. Um, so. Daniel, any thoughts? Yeah, and, and what I think uh, compares this w with preaching in individuals in, in verse 11, as far as the foundation, uh, the foundation he specifies as Christ, um, and, and so that's why I would say in the bigger picture, the foundation uh, is the doctrine taught uh, or taught, <laughs> not teach, uh, and and the work being done in general is is the preaching. But I agree with you 100% that the testing here is about the people who converted because of your preaching. So okay, and and even if we want to say the success of the local church. Because even that changes. You think about it. you could have a, a church that is extremely sound and faithful today, mm -hmm. and in 25 years from now, weak as water and playing with, you know, false doctrine. Or even, I mean, if we look at today, is there still a congregation at Corinth? Um, you know, are, what about in, in the book of Revelation as far as those seven cities named? You know, are there still congregations there? Uh, are there fi vibrant congregations in, in the other places in uh, the New Testament that we hear of cities? And, and so we see that, you know, likely some of those aren't, aren't even in existence today, which shows that they didn't last through the ages in that sense. The local congregation, like you said. So it, it may be then that kind of what we're looking at here, and I, I'm trying not to pick this apart too much, okay, and and I, we can do that very easily if we're not careful, is that sometimes the testing may not be the testing of judgment that we normally would think about, but just the testing of time in a and roundabout that's, way. That's something I, I don't know. I'm still studying, and I could see it either way. It, like you said, I, I it, it could be the day of judgment, or it could be just the the day of revealing as far as the judgments like in many of the minor prophets. Uh, the day of the Lord or just judgment in general wasn't necessarily the last judgment, uh, but but could go uh, the other way uh, in that. But. Okay. be good to hear from the chat room on this. Uh, we realize that there's a bit of a delay. So um, if you have any thoughts about whether or not this, this, this um, testing of fire is actually talking about judgment or just the, the test of time as all things are tried. Uh, we'd like to hear from you on that. Right. All right, well, let's go ahead then and continue, though. And he does say in verse 13, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And when you think about that, you know, that could be very figurative figurative, and just representation of the testing process, whether or not things survive. Um, the the more the more the earlier three things listed gold silver and precious stones last whereas wood hay and straw will decay and they do not last they're temporary temporary exactly All right, any other thoughts before we uh, kind of continue with this discussion are, are we at the end of verse twelve is that where uh, actually actually into the verse thirteen there as far okay. as can, with what we've been talking about. I'll say this, that um, for instance, some versions will just say because it will be revealed by fire, uh, that it could be the day, uh, but I, I would tend to think because of the context is the work that's being uh, tested in that nature. But I would agree. Th that seems to fit the context. I, I know it. it the, the people that 
I, I talked to or, or read who would take the day, just take that because it seems repetitive, but I, I don't believe that to be a very good argument because Paul often repeats himself and emphasizes something, but uh, I right. think work fits the context better. Right. Well, 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 I mean, as you read the second half of the verse there, he says, it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Mm -hmm. So yes. the, you've got you've got the it used a second time there, and it is definitely the dealing with the work. So yeah. what's where's the repetition? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so so that's right. That's yeah. that's a very yeah. good point. Yeah. So with that, Daniel, let's go ahead and read for us now verses fourteen and fifteen, please. Okay. It says, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Okay, I, I apologize for the folks at home. Uh, since we're on auto switching, um, as long as you're reading the verse, I can't throw the verse up there. So you got to be quiet. Let me throw the verse up there, and we sit in silence, or you read the verse. So I prefer you to read the verse myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there in verse fourteen, let, let's build upon this idea that he's been talking about. If anyone that if any if the work that anyone has built, and I'm reading from the ESV, let me jump back over to the New King James. If anyone's work which he has built on uh, endures, he will receive a reward. Now, flip it over. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Yet so as through fire. Now. If what we we're, were talking about earlier is true in regards to what he means by the actual trying of this by fire, it, it, it raises an interesting question. What will be the reward in verse 14? And we have to be careful because depending on what we say the reward is in verse 14, may right. you know, you, the opposite of that is not then what 15 is teaching. Right. And, yeah. and again, you have some comments to that effect by Brian Haynes. Oh, good. Let's bring those yeah. in. Yeah. I would tell you what, go ahead and read that. I won't be able to, okay. to uh, show it on yeah. screen. We'll, so. we'll do that. Well, he goes on and he says, I would suggest that since the fire can be survived, it is not likely the judgment. It is the day of visitation. Uh, 1 Peter 2.12, Luke 19.44. And he, he talks about there's a parallel would be Peter's fiery trial that he goes through. Or he mentions, do not think it strange oh, concerning the fiery okay. trial which is to try you. So, Okay. So. You know, interesting point. Maybe anticipatory of, or an anticipation of possibly the destruction of Jerusalem and the right. coming persecutions or just, just the general trials that yeah. come. I do, I do like Brian's point that... Yeah, and... and and I think more than anything, he, yeah, he he's talking he's talking about you as an individual. I yeah. don't think it I don't think it has to plug into a a destruction like that. You know, I you know the observations I made of, uh, in verse number twelve. I I I would uh, think that the points that you all made are a little better than the one I made. So just to make oh. that acknowledgement, <laughs> uh, if you know you know you know you know thinking it through in the context, but but I, I see the point here rather than being. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a s specific day in right. which God is doing a judgment through destruction, a day of the Lord. It could be a day associated with that person's life. Yep. You know, I mean, and again, when you think about it, if 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 the works are burned and so on, uh, that would tend to lead towards somebody wandering away or whatever you built with not accomplishing that which you hope that it would accomplish. But nevertheless, your efforts are okay. recognized by God. And, and I think within the, this specific context, it, it applies to the, the local congregation in the teaching, the converts, right. etc. And in verse 14, where it talks about receiving a reward or suffering loss, uh, even in verse 13, for instance, the ESV will capitalize the word day, uh, it capitalized right. the D and day to try to hint at a lasting judgment. And sometimes when we see a reward or loss, we think of judgment day or the last judgment day. Uh, but I, w I would 
consider or ask all of us to consider that you can receive rewards in this life. <laughs> you can suffer loss in this life. It doesn't have to be at the end time. For instance, in First John or Third John chapter one and verse four, we studied this. Uh, John said, "I have no greater joy." than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. The fact that the foundation he had laid or built upon was lasting and continuing, yeah. that it had been tested by fire and lasted, if we use Paul's analogy, he received no greater joy. I would count that as a reward. I would say that right. falls into that category. And when you look at Paul and the grief and sorrow he goes through, when people that he's help teach the gospel are falling away or are struggling or are being persecuted or are being tested he, he's going through turmoil in that sense he's suffering loss in in those occasions when those those converts fall away and so I don't think we can we always have to appeal to the last judgment day to get rewards or to get lost because even in this case if the people that I teach the gospel to fall away uh, guess what? I'm not going to be lost because of that. That fits the context here. And also, on Judgment Day, it's not necessarily that we're going to be judged uh, by how many people we've taught, the, or how many people have become Christians as mm -hmm. a result of our teaching the gospel. And I think this is, the Judgment Day is more a result of what we did rather than the result of what we did. But I hope that makes sense, you guys. Oh, shut up. No, I, I agree with that completely. It's, you know, it's the, the reward that one can receive is going to be, can be, just as the loss can be, what he suffers here, you know, the, the pain and the anguish or the joy. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah I think that's yeah. a good point. Yeah. And, and again, Brian, Brian Haynes makes the observation that the context that is set here, uh, per perhaps that context uh, you could consider 1 Corinthians seven twenty six a little later on when he talks about the present distress. Yes. The, the things that they are suffering because of that. You just wanted to read that comment because he said agreed, Tom, huh? No, I didn't mention that. <laughs> you just did. Oh. Right. I will say, just just for, uh, for people uh, in general, Verses 13 through 15 is a passage used by Catholics to try to teach purgatory. So just watch out for that and, and realize this, yeah, that the right. fire being used here is, is not one that's... Uh, it's um, not a punishment. It's right, a it's not a fire that's trying to destroy wickedness. That's not the fire yeah. here. It's a testing fire, if you will, not right. a purifying fire. And Correct. and that sets the difference between purgatory that says, you know, that fire is going to burn wicked out of you. And that's not the context here. The fire is the, more the trials or tests of life, if you will, uh, or, or Satan that are, are being thrown at you that you have to endure. Um, and, and so th just just a hint there of uh, to watch out for that, that some people will try to use the verse for that reason. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Right. All righty. Well, I'll tell you what, that brings us to a good stopping point. Um, Paul, any thoughts or comments? Um, <laughs> before before we go on to the highlights of the week, uh, no, I, I apologize. I had uh, with my my work here, I had to uh, step away for a moment. Uh, someone needed some assistance, and that's all right. Uh, unavoidable, and uh, I know you guys did a great job, and apologize for that. Uh, the local work always comes first, and we understand that. Absolutely. Yeah, most certainly. May, may I make one last observation before we? Yes. Close? Yes. Uh, in in this too, as far as not being a purifying fire, realize that we're not purified by fire. We're purified or we're cleansed, uh, not by a fire, but by the blood of Jesus. And that's where we yeah. get forgiveness of, of our sins. Exactly. But we are, in a manner of speaking, tried or made stronger by fire in a roundabout Oh yeah. Roundabout way. But you're absolutely right about that. Let's plan next uh, Wednesday, Lord willing, to resume with verse 16. There's a good bit there that we need to talk about, mm -hmm. and um, we're not trying again. We're not trying to pick the whole book of First Corinthians apart, word for word. But there are times that the context is better understood when we look closely at what is trying to what Paul is saying there. 
And so we'll resume next Wednesday then at verse 16. All right, let's go ahead and now and get to the time that I'm sure that everyone has been so anxiously waiting for, and that is our highlights of the week. And what we're going to do is to hand this over to Paul, and he will begin with our verse of the week. Well, as we look at an encouraging verse of the week, we've been stepping through the book of Philippians, and today we'd like to take Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. The Word of God says there, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. You know, we live in a world that is uh, me where success is measured and emphasized by how high you can climb, uh, sometimes climbing over other people, sometimes climbing at all cost, and that's not unlike the way the Pharisees were in New Testament times. They wanted men's respect, and they wanted religious power. Uh, they would trample others to gain advantage. We see that in Luke chapter 18 and verse 11, where we read about a Pharisee there, and the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. He was willing to stand and publicly humiliate someone else to make himself look more righteous, more spiritually successful. And here we have in the book of Philippians some instructions that our lives are not about selfish ambition. They're not about having a high-minded, conceited attitude uh, toward others but instead that we should esteem others better than ourselves and we should have that lowliness of mind. We should be servants, not trying to be better and gain advantage over everybody else, but to look at how we can serve others. Jesus talked about how the way of the Pharisees was not the way in which one of his disciples should behave. In Matthew chapter 23, we read there that the scribes and Pharisees, this is the beginning in verse 2, sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not according to their works, for they say and do not do. They bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers, but all their works they do to be seen of men. They make uh, their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best seats at uh, best places at the feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. I'd like to encourage us to think about this passage in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 today. That as we look in how we live, how we treat our brethren, how we te treat people of the world, uh, how we treat our families, that we look at how we might esteem others better than ourselves, that we put others before us, and how that we might have that lowly mind and not have a self-centered, conceited, attitude. That's our Bible verse for the day. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. Very, very well stated. Very well stated. And I liked how you overlap with my brief reference to that passage earlier. <laughs> very good. I appreciate that. Well, let's continue on now. And Tom is going to share with us the person of the week. All right. Okay. My person of the week uh, this week is going to be Gideon. Uh, the account of, of Gideon is actually found in the book of Judges. Uh, he was one of the judges of Israel. And of course, the period of the judges was a time of a, a few hundred years between the inheritance of the land through Joshua uh, until they appointed King Saul to rule over them. Uh, the judges basically were deliverers from the opposition or the oppression of, of enemies usually sent by God to, to punish Israel. After repentance, God would raise up the judge, uh, and he would deal with these various enemies. Uh, the account of Gideon is actually found in Judges chapter 6 through 8, or 6 through 9. Uh, he is also mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 32 as an example of faith. Uh, 
His story actually begins with Israel being oppressed by the Midianites for approximately seven years. And then an angel of the Lord appears to him, and he is told that he is to deliver Israel, and the Lord was going to be with him. And of course, the interesting thing about Gideon, he asks for a sign, but it's not because of doubt, but more for the sake of verification. Uh, and you find that as the, uh, the events, as they develop, actually there's three signs that he asks for, and they're all granted to him. And the first one is Gideon makes an offering to this angel of the Lord that is visited with him. He makes this offering and sets it on a rock. And then fire comes out of the rock and actually consumes the entire sacrifice. Gideon realizes who he is speaking to when this happens. And so he is instructed to destroy uh, an altar of Baal, which was erected in his father's house and actually is his hometown. And he does that. And after this, he is instructed, that is, Gideon is instructed to gather an army uh, of Israel, and he does that as well. Uh, but he asks for two more signs involving a fleece, which is a garment, and dew on the ground. At first, he requests that uh, in the morning there be dew on the fleece, but not on the ground. And then the second day, after given further instructions, his request is that there be dew on the ground, and that the fleece be dry. And the Lord was willing to do both of them, probably uh, or perhaps to build up the confidence, not just of Gideon, but also the army that he has gathered together at that particular time. Then you come to chapter 7, where what he is probably best known for is where we find Israel gathered for battle with about 32,000 men to fight against the Midianites. And, of course, the Lord instructs Gideon that the army is, is too big because if they gain victory, they would take credit for it. So the first thing he does is he allows everybody to go home that doesn't want to go. Uh, 22,000 leave, and there's only about 10,000 left. And the Lord says that's still too many. So another test is presented, and at the conclusion, there's only 300 men left. And with this small army of 300, Gideon surrounds the camp of the Midianites uh, and with lamps hidden in clay pots, trumpets, and their voices, they're able to gain a victory. You read there in the text that there was fear in the camp of the Midianites and, and when Gideon commanded uh, his army, they broke the clay pots, blew their trumpets, and shouted the sword of the Lord of Gideon. With this, the people of the camp of Midian, they panic and they begin fighting against and slaying each other. Those who survive flee the camp, but they're pursued by Gideon's army as well as others in Israel, and Midian is subdued and Israel is delivered. After this, there are some other incidents you read about in Judges chapter 8, uh, where some are critical of Gideon for not including them in the battle plans, but with diplomacy he calms their anger. And also you find the people want Gideon to rule over them, but he says, I'm not going to rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And that's in Judges 8.23. Uh, he does have them make an ephod, uh, which later actually becomes a snare as the people of Israel played the hearted, and they seemed to worship everything they could. Uh, nevertheless, we read that Gideon was faithful in all of his days, and it says that he had judged Israel for 40 years. And as soon as he died, the people again played the harlot with the Baals. Now, real quickly, as we wrap this up, three lessons that I, that I notice in this. Number one, God uses ordinary people to accomplish his will. Uh, Gideon was from a small, insignificant family, and yet God was able to use him. Secondly, there is debate as to Gideon's testing of God. And while we do not fully understand his motives, one thing we need to know is that Gideon never was rejecting God. Uh, he had a heart that was willing to to obey. The tests uh, that he requested just built his trust in God. And when there are problems with testing God, uh, uh, it, it's not about one verifying that what we are to do comes from him. Uh, incidentally, that's why we study his word. Uh, but criticisms over the commands or the instructions that he has given us, that's what often happens. And then the third and final point is God can deliver us from our enemies. Sometimes he uses the help of the godly. In fact, it is through the godly that we are going to find deliverance from immorality if it happens. So let us strive to be that help 
in a world that is in bondage to sin. Appreciate that, Tom. I've often found it interesting that, like you pointed out, Gideon made, the, as you called it, the ephod, and I had to think about that. Yeah. I call it an ephod. I don't know yeah. what's the next <laughs> proper way yeah. of saying it. It was um, some kind of a garment that encased something, though. <laughs> yeah, and, and I suspect yeah. it had the Urim and the Thummim on it, you know, right. the means of communication there with God. But it's interesting that they turned it into a relic to worship. Yeah, you like know, they did right. everything. Exactly. Uh, yeah, 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 they did it with everything. They did it with the the, the serpent and whatever else. Yep, so. exactly. All righty. Well, Tom, I appreciate that. And now let's move on to the place of the week. Let's look at the place of the week. And I decided with this one that what I would like to do is go to a source of great authority on this location. The location we're going to be talking about is the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden. It was a location, a garden, as the Bible says, planted, of course, by God, an, an area set up for man to live in and then the woman to live in as well. And you know, we, we make the assumption that they would have continued to live in the garden had they never sinned and been cast out of the garden. But people have often wondered where the Garden of Eden actually was. Well, I'll tell you what, I know exactly where the Garden of Eden was, exactly to, to the very location of it. There were four rivers the Bible talks about. The first of it was first river was named Pishon. All right. The second river was Gihon. The third river was Hadakel. And the fourth river was Euphrates rivers. Now, that's exactly where the Garden of Eden was. If you could find where those four rivers were and know exactly which rivers they were talking about, because this was pre-flood, pre-flood, then you would have a reasonable idea of where the Garden of Eden was. So let me bring up the handy-dandy map share for just a moment. And you'll notice here what some suggest. And keep in mind, we have to be very careful with this. This is uh, the um, Euphrates River right there where my mouse is moving. And I'll move in, zoom in a little bit there. And you've got the Tigris River right over here. Some people say that there are fossilized uh, riverbeds that flow from here and here and try to put the Garden of Eden somewhere in this location. Maybe it was. Maybe the, the flow of rivers changed not a lot uh, during the course of the flood. But in the end, what we learned about the Garden of Eden is something extremely simple. It was a good place prepared by God for man and his wife. Unfortunately, because of their sin, they were driven out of this garden. And I would almost suggest that we look as the garden, look at the garden, not so much as a physical place, which it was, and not be overly concerned with where it was on the earth, but look at it representative of the fellowship with God. Because when, God, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were cast forth from his fellowship. And then if you jump over to Romans chapter 5 and you study beginning of verse 12 and following, you begin to see that because man sinned, that separation, that spiritual death, uh, was uh, fell upon man and they were therefore then separated from God. Now... When we become Christians, when a person becomes a Christian and enters into fellowship with God, in a figurative speaking, if you'll allow this, they enter back into the garden. Kind of think about that for a moment. Figuratively right. speaking, we're in fellowship with God. And as long as we remain in fellowship with God, then we will be able to partake in a figurative speak, speak, way of speaking of that tree of life which Revelation tells us is in heaven. And I don't think it's a literal tree of life myself, but it's the fact that we partake of the fellowship with God and therefore will continue to live forever in that fellowship as long as we don't uh, depart from that fellowship through sin. You know, it's some, a different way of looking there at the Garden of Eden. Right. Oh, oh, absolutely. You know, I, uh, you sometimes hear the expression, uh, the Garden of Eden was paradise lost, and then... When we're with God, you've got paradise regained. Yeah, in, in a manner of speaking. The, in with a the manner fellowship of speaking, there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All righty, now quickly let's move on to Daniel's Greek word of the week. And I have, um, oh, pardon me just a minute. I'm messed up. I'm still on the map, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> All right, now we're on the Greek word of the week. <laughs> and the, um, go ahead. we asked Daniel, if he would, to go ahead and share with us the Greek word that he shared last week. 
because we were off air during most of his discussion. Today's Greek word of the week will again be kara. And this is uh, what we translate in our Bibles as joy. And it's a, a, a word that simply means uh, joy that transcends all earthly circumstances. It's not a feeling. It's a state of being uh, that is much different than what the world thinks of as joy. And I'll, I'll try not to cover what I did get on air last week, uh, but try to provide some uh, fresh material on this word. Uh, of course, I don't have much record of what I did not say. Uh, but when we look at this word, uh, we ask ourselves, where can we find it? And, and the fact is, we can find it in God's kingdom, Romans 14 and verse 17. Uh, we can find it with the Father in Romans 15, 13. We can find it with the Son in 1 Peter 1 in verse 8, we can find it with the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5.22 when we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And so uh, we find it in the Godhead. We find it with God. This is not something we're going to find with human beings. This is something that originally dwells with God, and in order to obtain it, we must have fellowship with God. So to be in, in Christ equals joy. And that's why we see joy in Christ many times in Scripture. Uh, in fact, this word appears uh, with its, its variants about 133 times in, in the Greek New Testament. It appears very often. But what produces joy in Scripture? Because I think sometimes that's what we ask as individuals is, I don't feel really happy or I don't feel joyful. What, what were the people in the New Testament joyful over? And we look at Matthew 28 and verse 8, for example, and we see that these people were joyful because of the resurrection of Jesus. There were others, we see in examples, of people joyful because they, they found out about God's power, or they heard Jesus' teaching, or other people were saved uh, because of the teaching of the gospel. Uh, there were people told in James chapter 1 to be joyful in various trials. Uh, in Acts 13, there were people who were joyful even though they were being persecuted. Uh, there were, Paul took joy in just the unity of the saints. And there was joy by John in just his brothers and sisters in Christ. So there's a variation of different uh, feelings or spectrum that joy was obtained through. And it's interesting to realize that this type of joy, as 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 would tell us, is one that can be always had. It's not something that is passing w with a good day or a bad day, but a state of being that lasts as long as we're in Christ. And, and we have to ask ourselves this question. Now, although we've considered the truth about joy, what's, what's the factoring of it? How do we have that continual joy? Well, as we know where to find it, but maybe if we don't feel joyful, uh, one, number one, we're trying to judge it by the wrong standards. We don't want to judge it by the world's standards. We want to judge it by God's. And I would encourage you, if maybe you're not joyful as you should because you're not recognizing God's power, maybe you're not reading your Bible like you should, maybe you're not building your faith or sharing your faith or putting your whole trust in God. Maybe you're not helping others like you should be. Maybe you're not spending time with brothers and sisters. Uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, I guess, with these individuals, uh, and I appreciate you all uh, who are here to learn more about God's Word, to have more study, to be with brothers and sisters in Christ, but let's also learn how to be able to share things with others as well and not just be uh, keepers of the knowledge but sharers of the knowledge so that others can also have this type of joy. But that will be our Greek word for the week today, kara. Daniel, I appreciate that. Did and you I say choir? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. And, and I'm glad that you covered it again, because it is a very important word, and I think necessary for us to keep in mind and remember. Alrighty, that brings us then to another end of the Truth Factor discussion. I would like to thank you so much for joining us for this time period of studying the Word of God. If you would like to contact us, 
you can see in our lower thirds that we are now turning on the way that you can contact us individually. Uh, typically, the way we have it set up is either Tom, Paul, John, or Daniel at truthfactor.com. Just don't put them all together like that. Uh, if you want to put them all together, send it to questions at truthfactor.com. Any final thoughts? Uh, let's throw this to you, Daniel. Start with you. I'll just say thank you for our study today, everyone, and look forward to next week's study, and God be with you all. Very good. Appreciate that. Paul? Just keep factoring the truth, studying, understanding, knowing, and applying. Yeah, and Tom? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Same thing, Ditto. Thanks, everyone, for your participation in the chat room, and uh, looking forward to next week. Absolutely, absolutely. We'd like to invite you to join us for our next Truth Factor discussion, where we set out to factor the truth into our daily lives. The Truth Factor discussion airs every Wednesday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. That's noon Eastern Time. 9 o'clock Pacific Time. And 7 p.m. Israel Standard Time. Right here at Live dot truthfactor dot com. Have a wonderful week.